So, hello everybody. Uh, this talk is going to be about C17 and C20 goodies. Uh, now, for, yes, it's even. Hi, Jonathan. Uh, so, uh, for people who have been to academies before or who have met me before, I'm going to skip about me because there isn't really that much time. Uh, Usual disclaimer, make your code readable, pretend the next person who looks at your code is a psychopath, and they know where you live. Very, very important note. I'm going to, uh, I'm not going to explain uh, what the code means. Uh, you should all assign the meaning by yourselves. Now the question is, why am I giving the same talk again? Because in Academy 2017, I already had a talk named uh, C17 and 20. Uh, that talk was a little bit focused on, uh, let's say, bigger features of C20 and some smaller features of C17. Now the things have changed a little bit from, uh, C, uh, from 2017. Uh, we finally got C20 ratified. So this is a photo from the Prague meeting of ISO CPP, uh, where the C20 was finalized. And two days ago, uh, C20 was accepted by the ISO. So it's now an official uh, proper standard. And during those three years, uh, all the compilers that we care about uh, now support C17. Uh, so I'm going to focus mostly on little useful features that C17 gives us with a couple of C20 features. I'm not going to cover any of the huge C20 things. Uh, for those, you can go and watch the video from Academy 2017, or you can just find dedicated talks on uh, ranges, coroutines, and stuff. OK, so let's begin. This is a little bit slow. Uh, so in C11, we got a function called std to string. And this function is a little bit tedious because you can't convert strings to string. You can't convert characters to string. You can, it's essentially, you can just convert things like integers and floats, etc. So if you wanted to write a function that extends the standard to string, we could do something like this. So uh, we can create a generic function that uh, that obviously accepts any type t. And if we uh, if we got a proper std string inside as a t, then we don't really have to call std to string. Now, in new beautiful C17, we can check this at compile time whether type t is some specific type that we want. So we can just write if const expert and then check is same t and std string. Now in this particular slide, we have two features that didn't exist before C17. The first one is that now we have prettier type traits. So uh, all the type traits in the standard library, in the header type traits, uh, have the suffix underscore v and underscore t. So instead of having to write is same something something colon colon value, you can just say is same underscore v, and it shortens the code a little bit. Uh, much more important is that now nowadays we don't need to write type name stddk colon colon type or anything like that. We can just say stddk underscore t. So these type names uh, we had to sparkle over our code almost everywhere. Uh, apart from having these suffixes in C20 and expected in C23, uh, we will have uh, this quite, uh, even in the cases where you still need to write type name in C17 and 20, in C23 it will all be just beautiful and you, you would all, always be able to assume that the compiler knows that you forgot to write a type name, so you won't need to actually write it. Now, for people that know what SDDK is, I'd say that you can forget about it, and that most of the time in C++20, you will be able to use uh, SDD remove CVRF, 
So if you have a type and that can be a const reference, volatile reference, or anything else, and you want to strip out all the reference parts and consts and volatile, you can just say nested remove cvref underscore t and pass it a certain type like const string, uh, const string ref. And this will this meta function will return you a normal string. So this is one of the things that is new, small thing that will make up your code much prettier uh, in C17. The second one is the compile time if or if const expr. Uh, if we tried to call is same v uh, with a normal if and then try to put it in a function uh, that checks whether something is a string, if it's a string, then don't call to string. And if it's not a string, then call to string. Uh, then you would have, have a compiler error because both branches of if need to be uh, valid. In this case, if you're using if const expert, then only one of the branches will actually be compiled. Both of them need to be valid in syntax, but uh, the type T that we passed uh, doesn't need to have a uh, two string function uh, to work on it if uh, is same v returns true. So if you go to the first branch, the second branch will not really be checked for semantics. Uh, also, we can, instead of just checking uh, whether something is is same, we can also check std derived from. Now, std derived from doesn't have underscore t because it's not a type trait. It's something that is uh, available in C++ and and it's called a concept. In essence, for the time being, just think of concepts as compile time functions that return true or false, just like is same did. It just defined with a different syntax. And if you want, instead of supporting uh, types that are not uh, derived from, from a string, you can just call static assert in the else branch. Now, this is going to lead to a problem because, as I said, both branches are going to be compiled but not checked semantically. In this case, static assert is going to make a compiler error because else branch, even if it's not going to be executed, the else branch is going to be compiled. If you wanted to uh, do something like a static assert of false, uh, what you should do instead is create a meta function like the function that, uh, that is in the slide called always false. So whatever type you pass to it, it will return a false. And then you can use it in, in the static assert. So if the Boolean value that you pass to static assert depends on T, then it's not going to be evaluated in the else branch if only the then branch is going to be executed and compiled. Uh, static assert without an explanation uh, for the assert, so without a second argument as a string, is also added in C17. So if you are lazy and you don't want to write an explanation for your asserts, since C++ 17, you can just omit it in the static assert. Now, if we wanted to do it a little bit more modern, we can just say, OK, we are creating a template function, but we're going to restrict. We don't want it to work for all t's. We just want, to work, uh, want it to work on a specific set of t's. And we can just say, it's a template function, templated on t, and we require that t is derived from std string. And this is the syntax that is available since concepts is since C++ 20. If you want to provide several functions, one function that we, uh, works on types derived from string and another function that works on other types, you can use this trick uh, to restrict one of those functions. By default, if the restriction is fulfilled for a certain type, that function will be called, otherwise it will fall back to the second function, the generic version without any requires clause. So this is concepts and constraints in C++20. Uh, also, if you don't like the requires clause, you can always use the shorter syntax. Instead of saying template type name t and then requires, you can just say template derived from string t and then implement your function. 
And if this is also too much to, to type for you, you can just say uh, string to string, not even, it doesn't even look like a template function, even if it is. And then you can just say derive from string auto, so automatically deduce the type that needs to be derived from std string, and you have the value of that type. So this is the most third syntax for defining restrictions on generic or template functions. So another example of a couple of new things that we have in uh, modern versions of C++ is, the, is this one where we have an if, we are locking a mutex, and we are checking whether a certain map contains a key KDE. Also, we can do something like this. We can write a range-based for loop, again, lock a mutex, and then iterate through all the items in a map. Uh, since we all know that maps are collections of pairs, this is going to iterate over all the key values in a pair. So what new features uh, do we have here? The first one is that we can add initializers to uh, if, for, and switch. So the old for from the dark ages from the C, uh, it already had uh, a couple of clauses inside. So the initializer, the condition, and the increment. And nowadays in C++20, we have the same initializer for the range-based for loop. And in C++17, we have the initializers for if and for switches. So if you want to narrow the scope of a variable, you don't need to uh, declare it in the outer scope and then just put uh, put it inside of uh, unnamed block. You can just put it inside of the if or for or switch. The second thing is that uh, scope locks. We didn't really have scope locks before. We had something that, that was called lock guard and it was able to lock a single mutex that you passed to it. Scope lock is a little bit more powerful. You can lock several mutexes at, at once, and it uses nice algorithms to avoid deadlocks, etc. So if you need to lock several mutexes, which arguably you shouldn't ever have to do, uh, you can use scope lock without any consideration of what locks first, lock, what locks second, etc. The second thing that is shown in, in this example is something that is actually not shown because it's missing. Uh, lock guard and scope lock are generic template classes, so they need to have template arguments. In C++ before C++ 17, we had automatic type deduction for functions. So if you call std make pair, you would uh, the compiler would automatically deduce the uh, generic arguments, so the template arguments for that function, but it never worked for classes. In this case, since C++ 17, uh, the compiler can deduce that since mmap mutex is an std mutex, that this scope lock is actually a scope lock of std mutex. And this works for most of the generic classes that you see in in the standard library, and it can work obviously on your types that you define. So you don't really, you don't need to write any more std vector of int when you create a vector. You can just say std vector x is of one to three. Again, this is still uh, the types are still not dynamic. This is not Python. It's just that the compiler can deduce from the one to three that this is going to be a vector of int. In the cases where you want to implement your own types, the way that the compiler deduces the types for, for the class is either through a constructor. So if you have a constructor that accepts a type T and your class is uh, parameterized on the type T, it will automatically deduce from the constructor if you called it with an int, it's going, T is going to be an int. But in some cases, you would like to help the compiler to do something a little bit more advanced. So if you don't have the constructors from which the compiler can deduce something, you can write something that is called the deduction guide. In this case, we have defined some type that is called my type, and we, tr we are trying to tell the compiler if somebody calls a 
constructor with an integer and a float, then what it, what it should deduce? It should deduce my type of vector of integer and a float. And you can write arbitrary deduction guidelines for, for your types. Sometimes con the constructors are nicer, sometimes uh, it, the deduction guidelines will be prettier and they're usually more powerful. And another thing that, that was uh, in the example that is from C17 is the aforementioned structure bindings. So we have a map. Map is a collection of pair key value pairs, so STD pair of something something. And usually before C17, we would iterate through a map and then access the keys and values as a dot first and dot second. Dot first and dot second don't really convey any meaning as the names are really generic. So if you want to assign the names to parts of a tuple or parts of a pair, you can just use structure bindings with uh, square braces and say key and value, iterate take all the, uh, the pairs from the map and assign uh, dot first to key and dot second to value. Now there is something a little bit annoying about the structure bindings. Uh, if we try to capture the key and value by, by value, so not a construct or anything else, we just wrote auto key and value from, from the map, we would expect key and value to be proper values. So we have an instance of, let's say, a string, an instance of an integer. Uh, internally, it, this is a little bit more complex. So uh, the pair from the map will be stored inside of a proper value with, with a type std pair of something. And key and value from the structure binding are going actually to be a reference to, uh, to elements inside of the pair. Even if the compiler is going to try its hardest to lie to you and to tell you that it's a proper value, even if you try to use decal type of key and decal type of value, which will return that there are normal values, that's not true. There are actually, in, internally, there are going to be references to the elements inside of the STD pair. So they're not going to be proper values. This has some unfortunate side effects that uh, when you want to use more semantics on these things, you can't really say return value and expect the compiler to optimize it for you. You will have to uh, do return std move of value, etc. Uh, and the last section, I have two minutes before the, the questions time. This was really fast. Uh, there are also some new things with uh, standard algorithms. So, for example, the algorithm std reduce, which kind of behaves like accumulate, but a little bit more generic. Now, if you want to parallelize it, you don't need to deal with threads to fire up threads or anything else, synchronization, etc. You can just say std reduce, I want it to be executed in parallel, so std execution policy parallel, and then just pass the same thing that you passed to normal std reduce. Now, if you hate having to write dot begin dot end everywhere in your code you can use the second version if, if the slide ever switches uh, you can uh, sorry uh, i have one thing uh, before so again binary search uh, the same thing as we used to have this binary search can be optimized really well if you have context for data so most of the algorithms in c plus plus 20 have the const expert added to them. So if you have data that is known at compile time, nothing will end up in uh, executed dynamically. The compiler will execute binary searches, sorts, accumulates, and everything else during the compile time. And to, to get back to dot begin dot end, if you hate writing those, then you should just use std ranges namespace. And then instead of having to write pairs of iterators, you can just write the collection itself. So binary sphere search, I'm trying to search 42 in the, the array of X's. This is also C++ 20. And the last thing 
a little bit related to reduce and accumulate is something called fold uh, expressions. If you don't have a collection of values, but you have a, a variadic template where you have a function that accepts uh, numerous uh, an arbitrary number of values, you can use fold expressions to do accumulation or do reduce of uh, all the values. So you can write zero plus dot dot, dot plus values. And when you call sum of one, two, three, it will add zero plus one plus plus two plus three. Fold expressions come in uh, different forms. So depending on whether you want to go from the left to right with your operator or from the right to left. And they can be used for quite, uh, quite complex things like if you want to invoke a certain function on each of the values that you pass. Uh, again, this is not a collection, just uh, if you want to invoke it on all the arguments that the user passed to your uh, function, uh, you can use uh, the fold expressions with the comma operator and say std invoke f on values and it will just unwrap into std invoke f on the first value, f on the second value, f on the third value, and so on. Another new thing in C17 is the std invoke. And this is a function that allows you to call not only lambdas, ordinary functions on specific values, but also to call pointers to member variables and pointers to member functions as if they were normal functions. So you would be able to write something like for each call delete later from Q object on window one, window two, and window three. And the last thing that uh, I want to mention because my time has run out, in C20, we also got a new library for string formatting, which is meant to obsolete the EOS streams most of, uh, for the most part. And we can write something like this to generate a really nice banner, welcome to Academy 22, 2020, sorry. And I think that's it. If there are any questions. Thank you so much, Ivan. That was super interesting and a very beautiful banner. Uh, we have uh, three questions, and I think we have time for the first one, uh, which is template functions or function template? What's your stance? Uh, the official name is a template function. So, uh, sorry, function template. Uh, it's usual that we, we call it template function, but it's a function template, it's a class template because they're not functions, they're templates. But in normal communication, these two terms are quite interchangeable. Cool. And then the last one, uh, do you have insight why while didn't gain an initializer? Seems inconsistent. Uh, so that was my first impression as well. But while with the initializer is the old C4, just without the increment part. So while with initializer would be the same as just writing four with the first uh, two clauses filled in and then semicolon with an empty third clause. Awesome. So it is inconsistent, but it's not useful. 